Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I've got Henry Doss online. Henry, how are you? I'm good, Michael. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. And you know, we talked about uh, computers and compact presarios <clears throat> in the pre-show notes, but don't worry, people. You know, I'm sure there's some people on the show going, "What in the world is a compact presario?" It's like, well, Google it. You know, there'll be Google a nice it. long history of of exactly. how amazing that product was. So, uh, share with the audience a little bit about you, and then we'll dive into the conversation. Cool. So I am a serial entrepreneur, started my first company in 1991, 30 years ago. Now that it's 2021, uh, had a series of different entrepreneurial businesses, um, some good, some bad, one ignominious failure, as I wrote about in my book. And um, for the last almost 10 years, I've been a business coach. So I work with entrepreneurs, help them level up their game, uh, get to the next level, unblock what's blocking them, uh, whatever the case may be. Launching a business back in 1991 and launching a business in 2021, and when you did the math 30 years, I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. But then the the former accountant in me did the numbers in my head went, oh, wow, 30 years. But 30 think, years. think about that time frame and how dramatic things changed. But I'm guessing the tools and techniques that you learned along the way you know, are, are still as useful today as they were in 1991. They're still the same as they were going back to the Stone Age, right? I mean, that stuff hasn't really changed. We saw up close and personal the advent of the internet, right? Because in 1991, uh, it was still ARPANET, right? Uh, by the mid-90s, I remember we got an ISDN line, right? It was like a Big deal. It was 1.5 megabit. No, I don't even think it was 1.5. That was a T1. Whatever it was, it was a tiny little pipe. But it, it was so early in the internet that they actually gave us, and again, this is for the geeks out there, a C plus three address, right? And in 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 uh, real language, that means they gave us 64 static IPs, right? Think about think about that. Out of all the you know limited number of static IPs, they gave us 64 as a little tiny company, right? So every single computer on our network had a static IP on the internet. <laughs> right now you got to pay, I don't even know what it is, 10, 20 bucks a month to get a single static IP if you want to say put a server that services the world. So that's how early it was. It was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, but it was a lot of fun. But as far as the rules go for business, no, it's just another tool. It's a mechanism. It's just a big fat highway with which you can sell your stuff. Before, we had to call people. Now we email them or we text them or we Slack them. That's all. Otherwise, it's pretty much exactly the same. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest lessons of anything we talk about today is even though we have all these fancy tools and smartphones and everything else, mm -hmm. the business of being in business has remained tried and true and, you know, serving your customers, finding what they need, having a product that one you believe in as yourself and being able to relay that to, to solve a problem for organizations sure. and individuals. It's about individual relationships too. No matter how impersonal it may feel at times, it really is about generating trust. That is what will bind you together. Um, even if you're in a, co a commodity business, you still have to generate trust. Um, now, it's actually very easy for people to vilify you in the public square, right? I, I have clients, they worry about their Google rating. I remember a few months ago, one of them sent me something about this client disparaged us and it knocked my Google rating down by like, I don't know, 30 basis points or whatever. Uh, they were all in a tizzy about it. And, you know, without sounding too glib about it, it's like, that's going to happen. Are you going to let that affect how you do business? Are you going to pander to the lowest common denominator so that you don't offend anybody? If that's the case, 
you're you're pretty much done, right? Because you can't live in that world, right? There are always going to be people that you're going to butt heads with, right? And now they can vent their spleen on the internet. It's part of the cost of doing business. Oh, it is. And, you know, a personal story, um, I use both Uber and Lyft for traveling and around town from time to time. And I noticed not too long ago, my Uber rating was five and I use it a lot. So I was like, that's pretty good. I mean, I wasn't like walking around going, I'm a five-star Uber, but no, but I noticed it, it got ding. Somebody rated me lower, you know, a driver yeah. or something. And, I, and I'm like, why? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what did I say something rude? Did I not engage them? You know, I was, it was racking my brain. The only thing I could think of was uh, it was a rather longer drive from, uh, cause I spend my time in San Diego and Toronto and I'm in Toronto right now. So okay. it was, uh, you know, downtown to where I live in Toronto and normally is about 20 to 30 minute ride because I didn't feel like I didn't drive down that day and I didn't feel like using transit. So, um, but there was traffic backup. So I think he, okay. dinged, he dinged me because he had to be in traffic longer. I'm like, well, I had nothing to do with that other than that, but I didn't lose any sleep over it. It's like, I'm still getting picked up by people. So it's not that bad where, you know, someone's like, Oh, one star. It's like, you're going to be waiting for three hours to get a ride because no one likes you as a passenger. <laughs> so it, it's the same it's thing. Like, it's your- like a black mirror episode, right? With the social, <laughs> social rating stuff. Exactly. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it, it's funny how businesses, are so focused on that and and businesses should always be focused on okay what what are our customers looking at us or what are we doing are we doing things well for them are we serving them and with the clients that i work with and a variety of other people that i talk to especially during this pandemic it's like reach out to your customers a little bit more than maybe you're used to and just ask them what do you need from us right now I mean, you might be making something for them all the time, but check with them, say, what do you need from us right now? Because that could be an opportunity or maybe they need to scale back some things or maybe they need to ramp up some things, but have those conversations and that grows. Get, a, get on the phone. There's an yeah. old, there was an old ad for some airline, I think, where a company, something goes sideways and they're in the boardroom and he's got an airline ticket. We're going to go fly to now all of our clients and go reach out and touch them. I get it. It's COVID. You can't meet with people face to face, but you can pick up the phone and call somebody. I mean, it doesn't have to all be super impersonal because emails and texts and stuff like that, you lose all the nuance, right? Only the words are are barely 10% of the communication. You're losing um, all those other interpersonal cues, right? Get on the phone because you lose tone otherwise. And people like it. Right. Exactly. Again, yeah, this it, is somebody this is an old school boomer talking, but yeah, you know, my kids text text me and stuff, and it's like, pick up the phone and call your old man. Not that mm-hmm. big a deal. I want to hear your voice. Changes everything, right? My wife even does it. My, you know, if my wife is like, pick up milk, great, you can text me that. But if my wife says be something like, we need to talk, it's like, don't text me that. <laughs> I want to have a conversation about this. I'm not going to do this over electronic means. So. Exactly, and and especially during this pandemic with Zoom fatigue and all of that, you got people, it. the people I've talked with, it's like um, let's let's do a phone call. And I actually did one yesterday, and it's like you know what, so you know what I look like, so uh, I'll, I'll spare you that tragedy, and we can just do a phone call. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. you know, the phone call was engaging. We had a blast, and it was a really good call. And it's like, yeah, it's you know, mix it up a little bit, you know. And it's, it's a and, tried and true strategy. But the point is, people want to do business with you for reasons that you may not understand, and you need to get into their heads and figure that out. Everybody's like, well, I got to have a unique value proposition, and I have to have this, and I have to have that. When I first started my very first company, I was an Apple value added reseller, right? They had, uh, this is before the Apple stores. Um, so you were a VAR, right? And people would say, what are your value? What's your value add? I said, me, my, I'm the value add. You want to do business with me. That's the reason. That's all it is. I'm going to do it better than anybody else that's out there. The Comp USA and all these things, you're just grist for the mill. They're just trying to turn over boxes. That's all. They don't really care. They might as well be selling toasters, right? That's not what we're doing here. 
right? We can sell you this dumb box because it's just a dumb box. You're going to plug it into the wall, but it doesn't do anything without you. Well, what happens when you hit a wall and can't figure stuff out, right? You're going to want a resource. Now there's a zillion resources, right? People go on YouTube. They want to learn this. They want to do that, whatever. But back then you didn't have that, right? You had to pick up the phone. You couldn't even really email people. You weren't going to get any responsiveness out of that. Yeah, the communication has definitely opened up where there's been a lot Absolutely. more opportunities. But with that, it also waters down a lot of experiences. So when that stellar customer experience opportunity comes, it's those businesses that can thrive in that area and grow no their question. business based on just how they treat people. And it, you know, and not not to segue real quick, but so in this conversation, we've mentioned CompUSA and Compact Presario. <laughs> I mean, my 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 way back machine is really spinning a little bit. Going, you know, all your wow. millennials are like, I wasn't even born yet. And you yeah, guys, are, I, pretty soon I, we're going to be talking about you know TRS eighty and Osborns, right? Exactly. We're just going to throw in everything that there exactly. is. Exactly, you know the, the you know, cassette the floppy, drives. Right? Yeah, the fl- you know, cassette drives, the floppy disks. <laughs> I remember you know, eight inch floppies, right? That's yeah, cool. you know what? I, I real quick side story. I, in high school, um, I was a, a runner for the school play, which was Greece, and there was a person that was doing all the design work and stuff like that. But uh, they, she actually still was doing work on the eight inch discs, which mm-hmm. I'm looking at this thing, going, "This is almost as big as an album." I'm like, "This, you know, it, it, this is insane how big this is," and, and you know, it's like handing the stuff and getting it back, and I'm like, just kind of weird. And then of course. You know, people see those now and like, you know, or even the, the three and a half inch ones. It's like, oh, the save icon. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I still have, I think I still have some, we're in the process of moving. That's why this uh-huh. place is in total disarray. But I'm pretty sure I still have some, at least some five and a quarters. You know, they held like 400 kilobits. Yep, I know. Right? Right. Exactly. You see a killer, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Like, a, a text email, I think, is more than that now, depending on what you type. We've so. gone to mega, to giga, to tera. Yep. I mean, I have a 36 terabyte, 12 disc rate array on the computer that I'm talking to you about here. Yep. I yeah, mean, so. NASA didn't have that when they were no. launching. No. Right? Yeah, <laughs> Not just, even you know. close. Yeah, just keep, you know, it just keeps you know, getting you know larger and faster. And I, and I think even with that, I think businesses, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, feel the pressure that they have to be fast and agile and respond like instantly kind of thing. And while in certain aspects there's there's that, but if your business isn't already prepared to do that, you're going to run into basically an empty room and you're going to go, okay, we don't have anything to be able to serve this client based on what, what the demands of, they're asking for right now. So love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, there, there's a there's a sweet spot there. There are some some clients whose demands are are just unrealistic, right? So that leaves you in a re- with a real conundrum. Do I am I the bearer of bad news? Is it my job to tell them that your deadline, your expectations are totally over the top and are never going to be met, or do I just play along knowing that we're going to be late because I don't want to lose the client? You've got to decide, right? You've got to decide what do you want your business to be. Um, there have been times with with my coaching clients where I've advocated firing clients, right? And that's a tough one. But it's addition by subtraction, right? Everything is Pareto, 80-20 rule. You will find in business that uh, 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clients, right? But in addition to that, 80% of the complaints and the customer support and all that stuff are going to come from 20% of your clients. And in many cases, that 20% is sort of the lower 20%, right? So think about that. I am burning up amazing amounts of resources servicing these little micro clients. You know, I had a customer who had all these micro clients because he had grandfathered them in when he started and gave them unrealistically low numbers. And now as the business had leveled up, it was costing him more to service these clients than he was charging them. Henry, what do I do? Well, what do you think you should do? You have a couple choices here. You can raise them up to today's prices and you can do it gracefully, right? I mean, I'm not one of those people who believe that you should throw away those customers who took a risk on you when you started. Absolutely not. 
right? There's something to be said for those early clients when you, let's face it, you didn't have a pot to piss in. You hung up a shingle, you said who you were, and people took a leap of faith to do business with you. So now here you are five years later, and you're now a seven-figure company, and yet you've got these micro clients. You've got to scale them up, or you have to cut them loose, or you have to set up a scenario where they will cut themselves loose. Again, this is a very, very delicate balance because it brings up more than just the nuts and bolts of business, but the emotional, really emotional entrepreneurship. Early customers having started from scratch a half a dozen businesses, I know, I feel sort of a a slavish loyalty to them, right? You got to dance with the one that brung you. But then you have to say to yourself, are they dragging me down and keeping me from getting to the next level? And that's a t- that's a really tough situation for a lot of entrepreneurs. That's it why is. they come and talk to a coach. Exactly, because they, they realize, wait a minute, you know, launching a business, we never talked about or went over how to fire a client or <laughs> you know, it, it it's it's straight up in the air, right? Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's you know, like the you know, the straight line analogy where it's No, like I'm an there. electrical it's, engineer. It's a, yeah. it's a sine wave or it's yeah, a square you, wave, it's something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. So but it you know, it, it's it's tangled like a bunch of cat fives in a really bad uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, data center. It's like, oh man. It's like in and, and of course the every different color under the sun too. I'm like, really? You know, can't we clean this up and make this at least look presentable? And if if there's an issue with the port, then we can figure out which one it is. It's How like, about labeling stuff? I just took a took a part yeah, of a giant a label. behind me a a, 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 um, a skeleton of a rack. Mm-hmm. I mean, you should have seen the spaghetti that was in there. And yeah. I actually plugged something in the wrong way and I actually looped the network and took the entire network down. So <laughs> these things happen. Been there, done that when I was yeah. back in IT too. So, yeah. so for, for businesses and entrepreneurs that are looking to launch something now, you know, 2021, and mm-hmm. even going back to the Great Recession, where there was a lot of businesses that were born during that time, sure. which you know, a lot of people think you launch a business during the worst times. Like, when is there a better time? It's like you got to start somewhere, so let's do it. So, organizations that are are thinking about launching a business today, you know, what are some of the things that you're guiding them to? talk about or even relatively new entrepreneurs that are maybe a couple of years into things you know what are some things that you're seeing over and over again if they could get past this it would definitely help them grow to the next level well you know there's two kinds of businesses there's there's uh, the origin story of businesses there's the the app the uh, accidental business otherwise known as opportunistic like when i started my first business it's because a friend of mine couldn't source some computers needed some macs for a client couldn't get them and i went out in the world and i got them and all of a sudden my side hustle uh, was born the other side is the purposeful business right where you sit down and you write out a list of pros and cons and you look at it and you hire a bunch of Harvard MBAs to sit down and chop it all up. Uh, In that latter case, what happens is people will do that and then they'll never launch, right? Because they're they're stuck being a visionary, um, whatever, polishing this up until it's perfect, but they never get out of the gate. In the opportunistic business, what happens is you start uh, with a set of, of strictures and, and paradigms that you start with, and you never pivot around them. You never introduce standard operating procedures, right? You never create any KPIs for it. You're just kind of doing it by the seat of your pants. And, you, and, and I was on a podcast last night, and I, I used a quote that I, that I use often. Success is a great deodorant, right? Um, and we see that, I see that all the time. People will come to me and I'll, I'll look at their business and it's like, wow, this is a really successful business, but it's a train wreck. It's like, how on earth did, did you manage this, right? Well, now I understand why they're coming to me as a coach because they need somebody to put processes into place. Um, as far as, <clears throat> you know, buying when there's blood in the street, the, the old Rothschild quote, uh, which is what you're talking about, there's blood in the street now. Now it's the time to buy, right? Now it's the time to start a business. Uh, I wrote a thing. It's on my website. It's five reasons small businesses fail. And the number one reason, as you would probably guess, is idea. Your idea sucks. It just does. You just have a stupid idea. But you might be wedded to it or married to it, or you may have a lot of an emotional investment in it. You have to step back. You have to kick the crap out of that idea. 
Go ask your friends. Go ask the curmudgeonly friends that everybody has. The one who's negative about everything. Go ask that that guy or that gal. Have them eviscerate it, rip it to shreds. And then think about the things that they said and whether they have any validity or not. Or whether this person's just being, you know, negative Nancy. Um, if after that's all said and done, there's still a core of an idea there, then you're on to something, right? So what's the next step? Go out and look out in the world and see who's doing that, right? I've had people come to me and, it's, and I'll ask the question, who else is doing it? Nobody. I said, well, that's a huge red flag because the truth is you ain't that smart. You did not create this out of whole cloth. Even Facebook, which is a you know gargantuan entity, there was Friendster, there was MySpace. They were not the first ones out of the gate. He saw what the early adopters had done and said, I can do this better, right? But there better be some other people out there because if there aren't, there's, there's two reasons. Either people have tried and failed and discovered that there's no business there. And the second one is, what the heck is the second one? Um, tried and failed, or it's just a crappy idea. <laughs> That's just what it is. I mean, it just, there's, there's no way to make money with it. It might even be a monumentally great idea, but there's no way to monetize it, right? Um, I was just introduced to... Um, Yesterday, a, uh, something that's like a Craigslist alternative to, you know, sell stuff because I'm moving. And, and I sold two things in, within the same day doing it. But then I look at the app and I say, wow, this is a great app. But they didn't make any money on this. Mm-hmm. They didn't charge me a commission. It wasn't like eBay. So what's the end game? What's their goal? How are they going to make money? Because ultimately, you got to make money because you need money so that you can hire good people, so you can level up your business. Otherwise, all you've done is is created a solopreneurship. And what I often say is you've just created a job, you can't quit. Exactly. And nobody wants to do that. Yeah, like I I joke with people. I've done it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we've all made that mistake. We've all, we, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, traded their nine to five for the nine to midnight. (laughs) And and they're like, wait a minute. Uh, You know, then they start second guessing, you know, maybe my boss wasn't such a jackass after all. And I could just go home and not have to work. I could go on a two week vacation and never have to call the office. Gee whiz. Exactly. That interesting. Exactly. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, again, I, I love how you 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 hammer home the you know, that idea might suck, and because it is, you know, you, and I've seen it. I've been to enough conferences and you know startup and entrepreneur shows and all of these. I was in an angel things. group and I watched yeah. people pitch and they they come up and the blah 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 business is broken and our new fancy widget fixes that. This is the way every presentation starts, right? Just write me a check for five million bucks and. Well, you know, the world will be our oyster and and nine out of 10 of those businesses will burn up all that money and just crash and fail. Yeah, because they haven't thought past the first step or the second step. They fell in love with the idea without really thinking that this is, uh, as I wrote uh, somewhere on my blog, trillions of dollars have been saved by people not executing dumb ideas. Exactly. And it, uh, it, when you say, you know, the, you know, falling in love with an idea, I often think that you almost, I don't want to say despise the idea <laughs> or you're like reluctant to do it, but you're like, well, there's something here about it. Let's, let's see. And That's actually a good sign. If you actually hate it. <laughs> yeah. If you hate it, but then you talk to other people, it's like, no, this is actually good. And you're like, really? Then at that yeah, at that point you just you get you map out a plan. Say, so okay, I'm going to build this thing up, get it to where it needs to be, and then I'll find somebody that wants to buy it from me. I'll take some profit off of it and go do something else. Or depending on how much that profit is, they'll go somewhere else and you know find a, a chair, buy some water, and that will be how they spend the rest of their days. You know, yeah. to each well, their it, own. It, it's so easy now to vet your ideas. So. So for instance, so I wrote a 432 page book called FQ Financial Intelligence and I give it away. You can go to go to my website dasknowledge d-a-a-s knowledge.com and you can download it for free. And I wrote it as a course and it's, you know, it's a monster and I tested it with a dozen people and I was ready to go to market. And then a bunch of people said, "You know, Henry, you should turn this into a book." 
right? And that'll be your lead magnet. And that took like a year to do all of that. So I did all that stuff. And then I'm talking to a friend of mine who's a coach and he's more of a career coach. He coaches people who come out of the military to kind of re-enter normal society. And he sends me this landing page for this course that he's selling. I said, wow, this is really, really good, Tom, blah, blah, blah. You know, what are the details of the course? He goes, oh, I haven't created the course yet. I'm just putting it out there to see how many people would be willing to buy this course for $2.99. If I get enough people who are willing to do it, then I'll make it. <laughs> I, of course, did everything else backwards, right? Being in old, being old school, I built the whole thing, created it put a lot of sweat equity into it before I really knew whether anybody in the world needed it. I knew inherently that everybody needs to learn about money, but I built it first. That's a, it's a great lesson. A lot of times people will spend all the time and they'll waste all their venture capital money and all this and building this thing. And people look at it and say, um, that won't fit or that's not going to work. And all of a sudden you're like, uh oh, and it's like, well, maybe I can sell it on Craigslist or or that. There, there was a or, fashion, or the, yeah, there was a fashion site back at the at in like around 2000, 1999 That was you know the shizzle. I don't remember what the name of it is. Um, their site was gorgeous. They were really, really, really um, built something that was fantastic. The problem was that the pipes back to the whole ISDN line. The pipes were so small. Uh, and it required so much bandwidth that it 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 took forever. The user experience was god awful because it, the pages you would literally watch them come down the screen, unusable. Right? You would think somebody might have thought about that ahead of time. Now we take it for granted. Now if you don't have you know a terabyte of of a, of a pipe coming into your house, you're just some poor schlub. So people get lazy and they can build whatever it is that they want, knowing that we have unlimited bandwidth. Uh, back then, it was a real consideration. Exactly, exactly. And we won't even get into the, you know, the thirty-three point six modems and the sound <laughs> that, that makes. You know, oh, I go, I go back to three hundred baud modems. I I'm know. old. I'm I old. Yeah, yeah the, the old, the really old school. That's modems. what they had in college, right? They had mm -hmm. a mainframe and you had mm -hmm. a three hundred baud modem on your little VT two twenty screen. Oh yep. yeah. Yeah, those. But we all managed. We all survived. We did. We right? all this did. And business then. was around. There were tons and tons of businesses. Um, it, it's gone on since since the days of since they built the pyramids. I mean, yep. people have been running businesses. I, I espouse a theory that ninety percent of all businesses are the same. Right. I'm writing a new book. It's called Codfish. As an un, unlikely title, but it stands for customer support, operations, development, finance infrastructure, sales and marketing, human resources, what I call the seven silos of, of every business. And every business must have these seven, whether you're a solopreneur or whether you're Tesla or, or Apple or Amazon, they have these seven, no more, no less. And you need to have systems in place to manage all of these things, even if you're running a, you know, a, a one man shop, you just do. And they have to work together. And as you start scaling up, you are going to start seeing some some cracks. The I call them synapses. The the um, the bits that that connect these si and I call them silos for a reason because in many companies they are siloed. Mm -hmm. HR does not talk to development. You can't operate that way. There are synapses that connect those, and when those atrophy or when they were never created, that is when you get into trouble. Big time, big time. I look forward to that book coming out as well. So, Henry, loved our conversation today. Where can people find out more about you and this incredible work you do? So, uh, yeah, like I said, my website, daasknowledge.com. People misspell my name, so I also have DASS Knowledge, which does a redirect, belts and braces. Uh, my personal site, Henry Das, H E N R Y D A A S dot com. You can find that and, you know, my baseball cards and my golf trips and my screenplays. I've written 11 screenplays. You were talking about Uber earlier, and it was reminding me that I, about five years ago, I'll end with this little story. Uh, I decided as an experiment to drive for Uber and for Lyft and to meticulously document everything so that I could figure out exactly what I was making on an hourly basis. Right. And it wasn't pretty. It came out to like four dollars and thirty cents. And if you adjusted it for risk, now again, I wasn't doing best practices, but I decided to write a screenplay. And my screenplay is called Five Star. 
and it's a it's a kind of a romantic comedy about a about a a um, rather odd uh, Uber or actually the name of the company is Five Star, the ride sharing service, and he's about to get his ten thousandth ride, every single one of them rated five stars, right? And it's it's a kind of a twisty little little story. If you go on my website, you can read the first ten pages of it. Well, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, and it was a really interesting exercise to put myself. What the last night that I drove, I pretended I was the character Bobby, and I kind of I called it uh, method writing, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. method acting. I pretended to be the character in the screenplay that I was writing. It was a lot of fun. Oh, that is. I man, look forward to reading that as well. So, Henry, thank you so much for your time and and for the amazing work that you continue to do. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Breakfast Leadership Show, part of the Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.